the elders among you. I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Three thousand liters of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifteen hundred. Then he asked the second, How much do you owe? Thirty tons of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it twenty-four. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than other people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. 
So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I want to thank you for putting up with me for these past 11 weeks as we've been studying the New Testament letter of 1 Peter. Throughout the series, I've been keenly aware of the habitual practice of repeating myself or, or gravitating to just four or five verses in the text. Um, as I've often mentioned, that uh, a preacher preaches the sermon to himself first and then to the congregation. And therefore, perhaps, uh, like most of you, I, I need constant reminding of the main things and the plain things in the text, the, the, the plain things offered to us by way of Holy Scripture. Now, you will recall from our, our time in this epistle that the first readers of this letter, they were exiles. They were no longer wanted in Rome. They've been dispersed across the empire to the various provinces, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. They've lost their earthly inheritance. They're refugees. They're scattered. They're outcasts. And these Christians were, were treated as such. And amid all this suffering, Peter says, you have an inheritance that can never perish, 
spoil or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And there's this theme of suffering now, glory later, that just permeates this entire letter. Suffer now. Peter tells us to expect it. You'll remember this from last week, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised, but, but also, he says in verse 13, rejoice in so much as you participate in the suffering of Christ. And one of the reasons why Christians ought to rejoice in suffering is found in the second half of verse 13, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. The glory of Christ that will be revealed in the second coming, that day when all the wrongs will be put right, when he gathers all his people together from all over the world, where we're introduced to the new creation, will there, when there will be no more pain or crying, there will be no more suffering or mourning or death. And so as Peter reaches the end of this letter, he has a very simple aim. He wants to make sure that his readers keep going even through persecution, through trials, keep going through doubt, keep going even if you don't see an end to suffering like the frustrated kid in the backseat of the car, that familiar refrain, are we there yet? Peter says, no, you're not there yet. Keep going. And Peter, he's totally committed uh, that his readers see life as it really is. He's a realist. Are we there yet? No, we're not home yet. This world is a place where we have jobs. It's a place where we go to school. It's a world of car payments and mortgages where we surround ourselves with stuff. I mean, there's no other word for it. We're in our homes surrounded by all this stuff. But these places and these possessions will soon pass to someone else. I mean, they'll probably keep the house, but, you know, all that stuff, they'll just toss in a a 40-yard dumpster. But as followers of Christ, we do have a true home. We have a real home, uh, a new creation to go to. And we're sure of this because the risen Christ means that he's there waiting for us. And by his resurrection, he proved that this will happen. That that past certainty gives us a future certainty. Uh, a few months ago, on our way to annual conference, which takes place in, in Hershey, PA, about three hours drive from here, we were just uh, on the side road here. We're in Creamton Drive, and uh, from the back seat, our daughter is saying, are we there yet? But isn't that so like us? God, are we there yet? God, when will justice be served? When will evil be vanquished once and for all? For some of you, it may be, God, when will my personal suffering end? Are we there yet? God, are you there? And so as he closes this letter, Peter again casts our vision forward. He wants to paint a glorious picture of the future that will certainly be ours one day. Here's Peter focusing on what is to come, and the focus is on what God has in store for us in the future. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed, will share in his glory. Verse four, do you see what we have there? And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. You will receive it. That is what he will do. Uh, Verse six, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Uh, Verse 10, uh, again, the the theme of of this passage, and the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Those phrases there, he will restore you, will share, you will receive, he will lift you up. Uh, Could you see the theme here? It's what God will do. But, but for us now, as much as Peter wants to keep our, our vision focused on the future, on the glorious crown, on the inheritance we should receive, we do have to ask ourselves, what is the present reality? Well, well Peter zeroes in on it. It's real. Verse 9, resist him. Resist the, your enemy, the devil, standing firm in the faith. Remember, we talked about the old Methodist uh, liturgy of baptism. When a person was baptized, the congregation would respond with these words. Fight valiantly under the banner of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil, and continue his faithful soldier and servant to the end of your life. It's the same thing. Resist him standing firm in the faith. Because, you know, the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. I mean, what were you expecting? This is the normal Christian life. That's the reality. I'd like to call your attention to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, which we've uh, mentioned several times throughout the study. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, 
may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Suffer now, glory later. That's the message of 1 Peter. And since we're not home yet, since we do have to deal with the present reality, Peter says that, first off, in, in terms of church life, that it's absolutely crucial to get church leadership right. We've got to get the leadership right so we can keep enduring as a church family. We've got to have biblical leadership. So he says, elders, be shepherds of God's flock. And let's have a look at verses 1 through 4 and see what sort of leadership we need in order to keep going. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief, chief, chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Suffer now glory later. What, what does a, a shepherd do? Well, a good shepherd doesn't run away when there's danger. That's a given. And there's certainly danger throughout this letter. So Peter is concerned that these churches have leaders who watch over their flock. Verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. So I'm to care for God's sheep, knowing that they're not mine. Do you see whose they are? By Be shepherds of God's flock. They're, they're God's flock. They're not mine. They belong to him. They're his, and that makes all the difference. And as, uh, as we seek to, to go after these people, to, to gather them in, as we seek to be a church family, we've got to keep reaching out. We've got to keep in mind that these are God's sheep and not ours. They're God's sheep and therefore of ultimate worth. They're worthy of our attention. Now, verse 5 is, is very curious because he's been talking about elders and he's been talking about them shepherding their flock. All of a sudden, verse 5, Peter says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. In the same way. What does in the same way mean? You've got elders who are leading the congregation. You've got young men who are being submissive. Do that in the same way. Uh, what's he talking about? Um, how could those two things be the same? Well, he continues, Young men, in the same way, be submissive to your elders. All of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Now, the way this is written in English doesn't quite carry the full sense, but in the Greek, it's very clear that the all of you is no longer just talking about the elders. It's It's talking about, or excuse me, it's not just talking about the young men, it's talking about the elders. And by extension, it's talking to all of us who hear this passage. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. And that's what he means. That's how in the same way works. The elders oversee the flock with humility. The young men submit to the elders with humility in, in the same way. It's all about humility. That's what he's talking about, humility into which we are to clothe ourselves with. Uh, one of the great dangers is when a church is under pressure, when a, a flock is being persecuted, when we're suffering for our faith. One of the great dangers is that as a church, we start to criticize one another. No, we, that's when we need each other the most. Uh, when the world is bearing down on us, we need to be there. And so Peter says, be humble. Now this may bring us to an obvious question, what is humility? We've heard the word, we talk about it, but what is it? One commentator I read says this, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. So humility is the honest assessment of ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. And I think we'd like to uh, imagine or we think that, well, at least I'm not as bad as him. I may not be perfect, but have you seen her life? And you see, it's very easy for us to evaluate ourselves by comparing our morality with the morality of, of someone worse off. But now let's evaluate ourselves by comparing our so-called good lives with the holiness of God. I mean, there's no comparison. We're not, in the same, we're not even in the same universe. But you see, I, I find that, that sort of thing quite liberating. See, I'm so far off the mark that logically speaking, an all-holy God has to do the work for me because we sure can't. We can't even come close. And so we're all sinners in need of grace. There's no need for arrogance. It's about having a proper perspective of who we are. And if we assume that somehow we're greater than others, we're worth more than others, well, that's diametrically opposed to humility. And of course, diametrically opposed to God. So Peter tells us to clothe ourselves in humility. But then he gives us another reason. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 
If you've been part of our Tuesday night class meeting, you will immediately think, oh yes, that's Proverbs 3.34, uh, possibly. But uh, anyhow, we, we see this theme over and over again in the, in the book of Proverbs about who the proud are and the fact that God uh, does indeed oppose them. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it means to be opposed by God, but I, I can't imagine it's a good thing. It just isn't, it can't be. If the God of the universe is actively opposing you, then I think you're in some serious trouble. It's definitely not a good thing. And God opposes the proud. Therefore, again, logically speaking, we ought not be proud because we don't want to be opposed by the one true God. Actually, I don't know that anything could be more terrifying on earth than that. It's hard enough to have the world against me. The last thing I need is God opposing me too. So Peter says, humble yourself. Think of yourself less. So if God opposes the proud, we should certainly be a people who oppose pride in our own lives. The pride that we discover in many areas of our own lives. Pride of intellect, pride of, of possessions, money, pride of our accomplishments. Luke 12, uh, verse 11. The Pharisee t- stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. A spiritual pride. And... For some reason, if you can't place your finger on the pride that's in your life, I suggest that you pray to God that he will show you. He'll show you where that pride is. And then, of course, be prepared. Brace yourself because it might be uncomfortable. But um, thankfully, God is merciful. So God opposes the proud, but he doesn't just do that. He also gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. That phrase, in due time, it's sort of the unsettling part of that verse. Because, you know, frankly, we want God to lift us up now, to save us right now, to rescue us with whatever we're dealing with right now. But it says here, in, in due time, we will be lifted up under God's mighty hand. And I love that expression, God's mighty hand. We, we see that used in a variety of different places in our Bibles. And sometimes it's used in judgment. God's mighty hand is used to judge people. But very often, God's mighty hand is used in a loving matter, uh, manner. He, he, led God's, he led his people. He led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. God's mighty hand did that. God's mighty hand accomplished that. And over and over again in the New Testament, we see God's mighty hand being used in regards to the great deeds that he has done. So God's mighty hand, it could be a terrifying thing. God's mighty hand could be an absolutely horrific force. But here we see that God's mighty hand is being mighty not to judge, being mighty not to destroy, being mighty to lift up the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And then Peter continues to verse 7. Cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. No, it's frightening to be humble. We want to push ourselves forward because we think if we don't, then other people will take advantage of us. We don't want to be humble. And of course, we want to control our own lives, control our own destinies. And Peter says, no, you could cast all your cares on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you and he is mighty to lift you up. Now, you notice in this verse that Peter doesn't say that we deny the existence of anxiety. He doesn't say that we ignore anxiety, that we run from it. The anxiety that these first readers faced was clear and unmistakable. They lived under the constant threat of persecution. At any time they could be confronted, their lives could be put in jeopardy, their families taken away from them. And for Peter to address the question of anxiety was not theoretical, but it was intensely practical. As normal people who profess faith in Jesus Christ, they worried about the same things that most people worry about. They worried about their families, they worried about their future, they worried about their employment. Businessmen worried about turning a profit next year. Uh, young people worried about if the girl likes me or the guy likes me. And so we realize that these things that produce worry or anxiety in the human heart are are the same, irrespective of what century they come from. They they may face different circumstances, but by and large, it's the same circumstances, the same issues which confront individuals today. Some of us, we worry about being in crowds. Some of us worry about being alone. Some of us worrying, uh, worry about failing in life. Others worry about the emptiness of success. Some worry about change that comes to our lives. Others worry about the, the, the deadness of routine. Some of us are afraid of the dark. Some of us are afraid of the light and, and so on. And in certain cases, it could reach almost epidemic proportions. Cast your anxieties on him. Now, now this is, is really a command that demands effort. It really means 
throw all your burdens on him, toss them to him. It casts, it's the Greek word that the ancient would have used for throwing a javelin. Um, you throw a javelin, I don't, what does an Olympian throw a javelin? 200 feet, not sure. Uh, you get rid of it, you chuck it, you toss it. Do you do that with your burdens? These things that are, are overwhelming you, that are controlling your life, keeping you up at night, that consume your day, that, that you worry about, throw them at God. That's what we're supposed to do with anxiety. Instead of going through our days pressed down with the burdens of anxiety, we're to throw it, to hurl it upon the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to think about your love. I'm going to think about your wisdom, your providence. I'm going to put this on you. And when I pray, I give it to you. It's not going to be the base note in my life all day. I'm throwing it at you. Throw your anxieties at him. Cast them on the Lord. Because why? And why cast them? Why could you do it? Because he cares for you. That's why you do it. I wonder if there aren't some of you today who, who are just quite literally about to crack because of this burden you have on your shoulders. You're, you're just carrying all of it. You're, you're struggling through today. You're wondering how you're going to make it through tomorrow. And, and for many of you, it's been a, a real long time since you knelt down beside your bed and literally cast your burdens on the Lord. You see, God did not give us broad enough shoulders to carry all this stuff throughout our lives. God did not give us shoulders broad enough to worry about every single relationship in our family, our son, our daughter, our spouse, our grandchildren. God did not give us shoulders broad enough to worry about these things, but he did give us the responsibility to pray for it, to pray about it, but he didn't give us the burden to carry it. You can't do that. And the degree which you endeavor to do so will impinge on your effectiveness in Christian living. I love the story of John Wesley. He was traveling to America, and he was in this ship's cabin with, with two missionaries. He was already ordained as a priest in the Church of England, but Wesley, he really wasn't a fully converted Christian. And there's this tremendous storm that formed in the middle of the night, and it tossed the ship about to the point where any thinking person would have thought, we're all going to die. And, and Wesley woke up, and he was astonished that these two missionaries were fast asleep. I mean, he was terrified, and they just slept on. And he asked them afterwards why they weren't worried and didn't they realize the danger that they were in with the storm? And they said to him this, they said, well, our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. Seems a waste of time for both of us to stay awake. And Wesley was just staggered at the way they got through the storm by casting their anxieties on the Lord. That's from Psalm 121. He watches over Israel, slumbers not nor sleeps. Seems a waste of time for both of us to stay awake. So it's two things. It's the reality of the Christian life, suffer now, glory later. But in the midst of the suffering, I cast my cares on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us. And realize that millions of people uh, don't have a God who, who cares for them like that. And their whole efforts are, are designed to, to show what kind of great people they are so that they're worthy of his caring. Not so with the one true God. This God cares for us despite our, our inadequacies, despite our sinful nature. So we cast our burdens on him. We keep going till glory. Suffer now, glory later. And then in verses 8 and 9, Peter tells us what we're to expect in the meantime until God lifts us up. Verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We do have an enemy. And the enemy is ultimately trying to uh, make us abandon our, our faith. That's what the word devour means here. It's not about the enemy trying to kill us or torture us or anything like that, even though that has happened and continues to happen to Christians all over the world. The ultimate aim of the enemy is to get us to abandon our faith. Much more useful for, to, to him alive and not believing than, than dead. So then verse 9, uh, Peter says, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And that's how you resist the enemy trying to devour you. You stand firm in the faith. You don't compromise. And you recognize that our brothers and sisters all over the world are dealing with the exact same things, because this isn't unique. It's something that happens. It's, it's the common experience of Christians. And finally, verse 10, In the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Remember, this is the God who gives grace to the humble, and he's the God of all grace. And there's no limit. Grace is not going to run out. This is the, the God of grace who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
And after you suffered for a little while, he himself will restore you. He himself will make you strong. He will pull you out of the furnace and you'll be pure. You'll be firm and steadfast. That's the message of 1 Peter. And that, my friends, is a great hope. It's a, it's a wonderful assurance. And it's a certain promise. Let us pray. Um, those words, humble yourself therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Well, a moment out to throw our anxieties and our cares on the Lord. Cast them on him. Throw them at him. He's wise. He's loving. He's sovereign. He'll give you all that you need. What is it that's making you anxious right now? Cast it on him. Heavenly Fathers, we think of this letter of 1 Peter, this message of suffer now, glory later. We pray that you hold us firm in our faith. We pray that you enable us to Be your people who cast our cares upon you, knowing that on this journey that you care for us. Lord, we ask that you send us out with radiant joy, confident amid suffering, that we could trust you because you care for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.